Happy Wednesday. Welcome to, uh, we got an awesome call today. We got John Jasniak on the line. We're actually going to talk about um, seven figure subdivides. Um, he's subdividing rural land all over Texas, and the guy's absolutely crushing it. So, super stoked to have him on today. Um, before we kick off today's call, just want to take a moment to give credit where credit's due. Um, first off, if you guys are looking to join the best land investing community, um, it's right here. Um, on the face of the earth, the community where I launched my own business is where I actually started my own business. Um, and I scaled to six figures in just 90 days. I need you to go over to landinvestor.co slash apply. I'll just drop that right there. And I also dropped the link for landinsights.co. Um, now, based on the current demand of deals, Sumner and the team have put a monthly enrollment cap of just like 15 new members every single month. Um, spots are very limited. So if you're looking to blow your land business up in 2024, I recommend applying. Um, we're actually going to give away data today. So anybody who goes to landinvestor.co slash apply and set, uh, schedules a call with Justin, what we're going to do is we're going to take all those emails and we're going to pick one and we're going to give away 5,000 records for a handpicked county. Um, so let me know. Definitely hop on there. And then someone's going to let me know the person and we're going to send that out. Um, last but not least, we have Land in, uh, Land Insights. Um, actually, just launched the other day uh, and completely sold out in like minutes. So you guys crushed it. Um, that's V1. V2 is going to be absolutely insane. Um, if you haven't heard already, this tool like completely revolutionized revolutionized the way we pick markets. So it really helps us kind of shave dozens of hours off per month um, with our market selection. Uh, it helped us doing this by like also finding hidden markets and hidden deals where hardly anyone else is going. Um, we call these like liquidity pools. Uh, for the upcoming launch, we had 25 seats and they sold out in like minutes. So it was insane. Um, but if you still want to get on the wait list for V2, when that goes out, that's going to be a total game changer. Game changer. Landinsights.co. Um, head on over there and just quick click in there. You're going to just put your email and name and you get added to the list and we'll let you know when the next uh, launch goes. When that goes, it's going to sell out super fast. Um, all right, that's enough showing. Let's talk to John. John, what's up, man? Hello, Dennis. What's going on, man? Thanks for having me. Yeah, dude, stoked to have you here. Um, really excited to kind of talk about your business and what, what you do. Um, it's a little bit different from what our business is. You know, we're more in like the flipping stuff. Um, we buy, sell land as is. Sometimes we do minor subdivisions and stuff like that. Um, I think you're on a higher scale, mostly do creative finance and subdivides. Is that correct? Yeah, a lot of seller financing, a lot of private money and um, major and minor subdivides. We got both going on right now. Awesome. Awesome. And you're currently sitting in a town that you own, right? <laughs> That's right. I'm sitting in Cornutus, Texas, which is in Hudspeth County, Texas, which is actually where I did my first land deal. And yeah, we're out here uh, putting tile in the cafe kitchen today. We fixed a water problem. I was telling you, we didn't have water for the last 24 hours out here. We got one pump that controls an entire 28 acres and improvements doing two gallons per minute on a 900 foot deep well. So that pump goes out and we can't get water to the property. Wow. That's pretty crazy. Is this stuff you anticipated as the mayor of a town? <laughs> That's funny. I was telling the electrician came out today. I was telling him today. I said, man, I really thought I was, I took this over. I was like, oh, it's going to be minor fix ups. Get it going month or two, month or two. I, I keep saying another month, another month, another month. And now we're into doing roof jobs and freaking concrete and tiling and painting and RV parks and all sorts of stuff. So it's an adventure. <laughs> Way Welcome more than I expected. Welcome to being a landlord, bro. <laughs> yes. That's not something that we signed up for when we start the land business, right? That is no. for sure. That's what I'm getting out of is I'm done with landlording and dealing with tenants and toilets. I've been in it for 14 years and now I'm like, I can't take the, that run around. So yeah, that's why I love land. It's totally different, man. Um, that's awesome. So, uh, let's go real quick. Just tell us like a little bit about you, like how you got into land. So anybody that doesn't know John, let's just hear who John is. Yeah, so John Jasniak, you can follow me on all social medias at John Jasniak. Um, got a lot of stuff out there, and I've been doing land now, buying and selling land since 2017. Um, I heard about it in late 2016 on a podcast, like probably a bunch of people hopping on this call. Heard it on a call, heard it on a podcast, Side Hustle Show, episode 108. Uh, that's what I, I always drop that episode. Mark Podolsky, one of the OGs from the Land Geek. 
mm-hmm. came on, started talking about buying and selling land, owner financing, creating notes. Um, thought it was interesting, bought his course, bought the Land Academy course, and studied those for a month or two. I was engineering at the time. I was a petroleum engineer working in West Texas. And, you know, started studying the land game in West Texas. That's how I've gotten kind of my roots and start in West Texas. I was working oil field out in Midland, Texas as an engineer drilling oil wells and um, found this land niche. And slowly but surely, you know, I bought my first deal out here in Hudspeth County in the Gunsight Ranch, 53 acres, bought it for 8,500 bucks, sold uh, sold it for about double 17 Gs. And then next thing I knew, I was sending out direct mail like you guys teach and talk about and finding deals and um, it, it snowballed from there, man. The first year we did, I built my note portfolio up to like 13,000 per month. I'm, I'm a huge oh, passive <laughs> owner finance guy. And then it snowballed to these major subdivides and coaching and helping people now as, as well. I'm doing large projects. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. So, yeah. all right. So um, when you did your first landed, did you think you would grow into like doing these subdivides or was it kind of like something you're like, ah, I'm just going to try this out and see what happens or what? Yeah. So I was actually thinking about this not too long ago. Like, how did I get here? And did I ever envision this? The long, uh, the short story is no, I didn't. I thought that I was always a very motivated person and really wanted to leave my nine to five job, not because I didn't like engineering, but because I just wanted more. So I thought for sure I could get to the point where I didn't have to work anymore and I could, you know, collect a bunch of monthly payments and sell land and and live comfortably but then it just i don't know i just kept going and it was just it's addicting and you just if you're a growth-minded person you can't really help but just continue to grow continue to learn and um you know so no i did not envision that i'd be (laughs) subdividing land building roads owning a town traveling all over doing all this stuff but um it never starts that way right you got to start somewhere that's it that's it so what is your business model from then to now? Like what's your current business model today and going Yeah, forward? and I think this is very relevant to all kind of beginners, even intermediate people. I think when I started out and when most people start out, you do, you know, small deals. You buy a piece for five grand, 10 grand, sell it for 10, 20. You do flips, maybe you originate a note for three, four, 500 bucks a month, you send out some direct mail, you get some deals under your belt. And I certainly started that way. Um, and I think where this ends or should end for most land investors is subdividing at scale, because even just mm-hmm. one subdivision uh, can change your life. You know, I did one subdivide that was a $5 million project. We got ones going right now that are a million, $2 million projects. And so just one of those for the average investor is going to change things a lot. And so right now it's doing both major and minor subdivides at scale kind of all over Texas is, is where I focus. Um, but we got folks doing it all over the country, but for me doing it all over Texas, um, you know, built a $10 million company now, um, doing subdivides and instead of doing, you know, 10 small deals, you can do one medium to large subdivide and make way more money. So I think that's where the business should progress for every land investor, but you can't start there overnight. Like don't try to make a million dollars on your first deal. It's not practical. No, it's not practical. You end up running through, you know, spinning your wheels and stuff like that, trying to figure it out. Um, so John is actually currently in Coronuda. So if some of the audio and some of uh, the internet's a little bit off, that's why. So, um, I don't know, you guys don't have great internet there. Come on, man. <laughs> Mary, you I have good internet. Too. I think I'm good. I, the audio, though, yeah, of course. I've yeah, you're fine, bro. I'm just messing with you. <laughs> um, you got me. So, so yeah, so I love that. That's an awesome model. So you kind of grew into it, which is awesome. Now going forward, you're going to continue doing that, do bigger subdivides and all that kind of stuff. Um, how do you typically source your deals? Yeah. And by the way, for y'all who have questions, drop in the comments. I'm looking at some of your yeah, commentary. We'll- I'm going to run, we're going to run through these. Um, I do a lot of stuff on the MLS for subdividing, uh, probably 80 to 90% of my deals right now. I actually find on the MLS. Now, this is what I tell people when you're starting off and when you're looking at smaller deals, those are a lot harder to find on the MLS because yes. A small property goes for sale for $10,000. If it's a good deal, it's getting scooped up really quickly. Those deals move with high velocity. So small Mm -hmm. deals, for sure, sourcing with direct mail or SMS texting, cold calling. A diamond in the rough, you can find it on the MLS. Like, you can. I found small deals before on the MLS. But when you step up into the six-figure range, it's another reason why I like subdividing is because there's a lot less competition. 
you step up into the six mm -hmm. figure range and you start doing um, these bigger deals. And what you run into is you find these properties on the MLS that are illiquid because no one can buy them. They're 500,000, a million, two million bucks. It takes a very specific buyer. So that opens up the arbitrage for someone mm -hmm. like me, mm -hmm. who's an investor who can come in, buy it, probably offer them less than what they're asking and then subdivide it and force some appreciation and create some value. And now I, boom, I drop them back down to smaller lots, which are now more affordable and move more mm -hmm. quickly, especially when I'm offering owner financing on my sales side. Um, so we're probably at 80 to 90% on the MLS and probably 10, 20% from the minimal amount of mail we do or someone passing me a deal or a student saying, hey, look at this or look at that. Mm -hmm. And what do you, what do you look for? Like, do you look for like over 20 acres, over 60 acres? There's, there a specific range. Well, it depends on the market you're in, I would say, but really anything that could be subdivided is within range. I've done them as small as 18 acres and my largest mm -hmm. was, uh, we did a 465, I did a 640. So close to a thousand acres probably has been the largest. Um, it just depends on the arbitrage and the market, right? If I could find two acres and split it into two ones and make money, I would do it. Uh, but mm -hmm. when I set my filters and I'm looking for these deals, I tend to find myself setting them at 40 or 50 uh, acres and higher, um, at least in Texas. Nice. Okay. That's awesome. So that's awesome. I mean, it's so it's very attainable, right? To be able to do this, like to be able to find deals in the MLS and do it. You just kind of like have to look at the regulations for... Um, that specific area, whether it's for subdivisions, yeah. like minor or major subdivisions. Can you explain for anybody that doesn't know what a subdivision is, what's the difference between a minor subdivision and a major subdivision and why the two different approaches? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, typically the way most people, including myself and counties and regulatory bodies view it is a major subdivide is going to be anything that requires platting so that is likely smaller in acreage going to require improvements some roadways maybe water lines etc it's going to need some sort of approval process through either a county or a city or some government body and that's a major subdivide and that's what makes it hard because these counties these states these cities they all have different regulations they want paved roads they want you know potentially sewer or whatever and some of these pieces it's just not going to work so that's that's what I would call major subdivide. Now, minor subdivide is no uh, approvals needed. So basically utilizing loopholes to avoid any government body. And I would say under minor subdivides, you can still get into scenarios where you need to run power and build roads. We do it in Texas. We utilize loopholes, but we still go in and build roads. So we're not getting county or state or any government approval, but we're still doing improvements on it. So I think that's maybe a great, there's maybe some gray area between major and minor. A pure, like easy minor subdivide is like, you're not doing anything. You've got perfect road frontage and you're just carving up lots and selling off smaller lots. Um, probably a gray area between is like no approval needed, but you're doing some sort of improvements. Okay. Uh, and where do you find like where that information is for a major or minor subdivide, like the type of parameters? Is that just like a quick Google search or do you have to like go down and knock on the office doors and say, Hey, how do I subdivide land yeah. in this town? Like, can you tell me? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the good old days of knocking on the, the doors. Um, I mean, it all starts at the state level. So uh, mm -hmm. Google is very friendly to this. I, I would recommend starting just Googling, internet searching around. If you're in Tennessee, Virginia, Texas, whatever, uh, finding any state land code uh, regulations or subdividing regulations or real estate regulations for um, the state. And if you can't find it online, you're probably going to have to be calling uh, someone in the state, whether it's like someone in the congressman's office or someone down at some regulatory body at the state office at the state capitol. Um, that's more than more than doable. And at the end of the day, you're going to find yourself getting your hands on some sort of like regulation document or PDF. Texas, it's local code 232. Like if you were to just Google Texas local code 232, it's going to pull up this fancy government, or not fancy, it's going to pull up this like weird looking government page where all the font is very like typewriter like and it's like official government code. Um, so I would say always start there, state level, and then you're going to want to go to, to the county level. Now, county is pretty easy. Like I can Google Midland County, Texas subdivision PDF, and it's going to pull up right away a 30, 40, 50 page PDF document that I can look through that says this is what sort of roads you need. Um, 
this is what lot frontages need to be, all that good stuff, and walk you through the whole process. And some of those county PDFs that you find online are 250 pages long, and you're probably not going to be doing any subdividing there outside of city <laughs> limits. And some of them are 20 pages long, and that's probably where you want to be if you're trying to do this business mm -hmm. model. Now, did, did so like learn all this information? Was it something you took a course for? Did you read a book? Or is it just a lot of Google searching and a lot of like trial and error? This was a lot of trial and error and tens of thousands in attorney fees later for Texas. We have done a lot of deep diving on local code 232, challenging counties, et cetera. But for any beginner and any normal person where you got to start is read the regulation yourself and call up the local county officials, state officials, and don't call them and start asking questions without skimming through and um, looking at it yourself. It's funny, I had a, a deal I'm looking at in West Texas and it has a uh, groundwater conservation district. And I made the mistake yesterday, I actually called them up and it's kind of the same deal. They have their own regulations and everything. And I didn't read their rules beforehand. And I got the lady on the phone and she knew I didn't read the rules and she was a jerk, man. Like she was, <laughs> thought she was going to hang up on me. She was like, oh, another wannabe land developer who's calling up and asking stupid questions. Um, Cause that's what a lot of us do, you know? I find most land developers don't actually study the codes and then they call right. up these right. county officials and they get kind of completely blown off and ignored because you got a bunch of wannabes, a bunch of people who want to do these projects and they're like calling and just asking questions and it's a lot of time and time sink for the officials. So, um, right. Right. you know, find, find it and do your due diligence up front and then start talking to people is kind of my recommendation. That's awesome. All right. So we got a hundred people here right now live. Um, What's a tip that you want to give somebody that's looking to just get into this? Is there one specific standout thing for them to shorten their yield curve like that you can think of off the top of your head? Yeah, start small and find the loophole in the state and county that you're working. Every state and county has loopholes, and they're not that hard to find. And another good tip here and good point is you got to start in a, 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 a concentrated area, right? It, it doesn't have to be by you and where you're living. Um, that's kind of where I recommend to start. But uh, what I'm getting at here is like envision me trying to know the Texas regulations, the Tennessee regulations, the Virginia regulations, the Michigan regulations, like all the different regulations and then down to the county levels. It's like it would be impossible. Like I would recommend getting a specific area and getting to know a county or two or three like the back of your hand. Um, that way you kind of have the honey hole that you can go back to and you know the regulations, you know what you can do, and you don't have to keep spinning your wheels and doing all this upfront research and trying to track down the right people to talk to and study the PDFs and all that stuff. Like if people would just focus in an area that interests them and double down on that and get to know that area like the back of their hand, then they could start ripping these projects off left and right. Mm -hmm. I love it. Um, all right, we've got a lot of questions, but we'll get to them yeah. in a minute. But let's do this. Let's... um. Can you give us like a quick rundown, like a case study? Yeah. And if I can present my screen, I certainly you should be able to. Yeah. Let's, do Let's share a screen. Let's see. <laughs> I'm interested, but how much is the course now? <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I love the screen sharing thing. The screen sharing is um, so powerful. Like when we're able to, I, I love the screen sharing whenever I'm doing presentations. I got some downloads here. You want Where's to this one? Let's talk about or... this one. Yeah, can you see my screen by the way? Yeah, I can see you. Yeah. Okay. So this one I found on the, on the MLS. So I'm on land.com. I'm on land.com every day, man. Like it is my <laughs> favorite the, tool. Uh, do you have the expensive version or just the regular version? Just the right uh, Oh, when I'm selling, I do have like a, a expensive subscription that we use for Premier or Signature Partnership or whatever it is. But you don't need that, especially when you're starting. Perfect. Like just come in here and get to know a market like the back of your hand. Start getting in here and looking at the market every single day. And this is the piece that I just bought. Um, we closed on it. Let's see. I have the contracts. I downloaded it before this call. Here's the contract. Yeah, that's what I was curious about. Well, is, did you need like do you need to spend six hundred dollars a month to find out this information? No, right? Which is awesome. No, no, no. Love mm -hmm. it. Yeah, land.com. And then what you'll find is that some realtors and brokers suck. And so sometimes, <laughs> most suck actually, but sometimes <laughs> they won't post it on all the sites. So land.com, Zillow, realtor.com, those are kind of the big three in my opinion. So sometimes 
you need to check all of them because you'll be on land.com and you won't see anything that interests you but you pop over to realtor or zillow and it's listed over there and so you kind of got to hit every single one uh but land.com is definitely the major one um this is this property right here that i just showed pull up the listing they're asking 250,000 this is a this is a relatively small deal for me but this is perfect for a beginner and i'm going to show you why um, 250,000, it wasn't selling. I was like, eh, I'll do this deal because it's so simple. And we ended up offering 25,000 down and 132,500 over five years. So it was 157.5 purchase price. Mm -hmm. Owner financed. Mm -hmm. Here's my financing addendum. I'm paying them 2,600 a month mm -hmm. for this property. And no, you know, do you 150. Do I'm sorry, you do 10, 10 year ands or do you do like a 30 year and with a 10 year balloon? I've never done anything like that. I always have done five to 10 years straight amortized loan. Now, can you get more creative? Do interest only, some sort of balloon? I've done balloons before. Um, certainly anything is open for negotiation. What you're going to find though when you're offering seller financing on a piece such as this, like most people are going to want their money relatively quickly that most sellers are going to either want cash or a really quick balloon or a really short note like no one's going to be like oh yeah i'm gonna amortize over 30 years and balloon in 10 or just straight amortize over 20 or 30 like most sellers are not going to be okay with that um mm -hmm. they just want to be cashed out but that being right. said anything's possible so you know i'm, I'm into this for 157.5 and they're asking 250 so I automatically got it like 60 cents on the dollar what's crazy about this one is it came surveyed already like this was wow. the survey it was wow. all broken into five acre lots we had power on this side power on this side and so what I ended up doing is selling off three 15 acre lots up here and four 10 acre lots down here um, it all sold in two months. This one is about to close this 10 acre lot for 35,000. It's sitting at the title company right now. These, these two I sold for 34, five, got 69,000 back right away. And I originated on, on these four, like uh, $250,000 worth of notes. So, I mean, you know, all said and done the profit on this, I bought it for 150. I'm probably going to walk away with like 300 or 350, mm -hmm. you know? Uh -huh within a few months, which is pretty crazy. That's awesome. So you're gonna do a bunch of these deals to basically get to $10 million this year. That's your goal? No, this, no. No, I don't think that's a scale. I don't think that's a scalable strategy because sure. you know, exactly. you'd have to do 50 of these if you wanna to get to 10 million, um, which is my goal to hit 10 million in, in one year. We've done five in the past, but to get to that 10 million level, you need to do more deals like this one. This was my Andrews one. You need to even go bigger than this. This was a deal I found in Andrews, Texas, where we, we did 32 10 acre lots. And uh, we also kept it plat exempt and we did private roadways through here. So I built $70,000 worth of dirt roads. It was like 5,000 foot of roads. And we sold 32 lots at it was like 4,000 per acre cash price and 5,000 per acre owner finance so i mean this one i bought for 510 g's and the gross on it will end up being like 1.3 to 1.5 so you know we'll we'll net like a million dollars but even to do 10 of these per year you can do it but i'd rather do like two or three like you know three four five million dollar deals is is the way to scale this uh business yeah yeah because this this takes a lot of it's a big time suck right and you're on the phone you're doing a lot of things Right, trying to get yeah. all this stuff sorted out. Right now, yeah, do you hire and, out a lot of this stuff, or is it like all in house? I have a small team, man. I have me and Brian as my full time ops manager. I have um, an attorney who's basically a retainer. I have a basically full time bookkeeper and a fractional CFO. And uh, yeah. I'm looking to make another hire or two this year, but we have a small group of like four or five people with two of us full time. Um, doing all this stuff. So that's kind of another tip I would like to say is like a lot of people like to get VAs and delegate like very quickly and early on. Like I've never really been a great, a big fan of that. Like the more you can do the better. Um, Cause you're going to learn, you're going to set scale faster. And now of course you get to get to a point where you need to hire out and train people and build teams, but you can do a lot by yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I totally yeah. agree. It's crazy how much bandwidth you actually have when you really get into this stuff. Um, people kind of yeah. sell themselves short and say like, oh, I don't have the time. But in reality, 
when you start mastering this stuff, you get faster and faster at it, um, which allows you to do more, right? Uh, one question a lot of people are asking is like, if you were going to start today, like, and you had no money, right? You've been doing this, you've been doing this a while, now you got enough capital, you got some money in your pocket, you could throw around for down payments. If you were just starting, obviously subdivides are not where you're going to just start. But where, was, where would be like a starting point, like a jump off point for you? And how would you do it if you had limited capital? So I would start with either a small flip. I mean, there's a few different things you can do. You start with a small flip, like buy a piece for two, three, four, five grand, send out some direct mail, find it, sell it for 10, 15, 20,000. Um, you can start with a small subdivide, like the one I showed. You can go even smaller than that, like 25,000 down and 132.5 over five years. Like there's a lot of people out there who can who can do that, who are real estate investors. But, you know, I've I've seen people start with $50,000 subdivides and they give 10,000 down or 5,000 down and they carry a, a $40,000 note um, with the seller and then they'd crush it, make 100 G's on their first subdivision. And, you know, another thing you can do is raise money. I mean, work with deal funders. There's a lot of people out there funding deals. I personally do not fund deals just because all my capital is getting plowed into my own projects. Do you guys fund deals? Uh, so I use private uh, lenders for all my deals. Okay. So I, I raise private there's... capital and then fund them. Um, yeah, oh, some can... of yeah. 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 So the Leah group, I don't know if they're funding deals, but there's a, there's a lot of resources for that as well. Funding. We have funders inside the group and we work exactly. with like personal funders and other people like that. Um, yep. but dude, it, it's so easy to find capital. That's always like the least of my worries is like the money. If you Isn't have a good crazy? deal. Yeah. Once you, it's a mindset thing. Once you realize like if you have a good deal, the money just finds your way. Like I got a deal in a contract um, yesterday, my acquisition, new acquisitions manager just got a deal in a contract. Buy for 145, just found out the exit's 350 as a straight flip. So that right there is a 200K profit, right? But now I actually want to look at, I want you to look at this and tell me like, I'm a, like first time subdivider. Is this even something that's possible, right? Because I think it is. It's 70 acres. Um, three and four acre lots sell like hotcakes over here. Is it worth like even doing it? Is it not? I mean, how would I kind of break that situation? Okay, let's start with where is this at? County and state. Person County, North Carolina. How do you how do you spell that? Like a person, human. Oh, person, person yeah. county, North Carolina. Yeah. Yep. Right, let me see. And I, I quickly nice glanced over this stuff, but it'd be good for everybody to kind of see like how you would do this. I'm gonna I'm gonna present your screen. Is that okay? Yeah, you. Am I presenting or are you? I just presented you. Okay. Yeah. Present me. Um. So, Person County, North Carolina subdivision regulations. Let's quickly look at if they got anything. Ordinances enforced by Person County Planning and Zoning. Planning and Zoning. Subdivision regulations. So it looks like they have a planning and zoning department. Mm -hmm. Subdivision ordinance. Well, here we go. This is a PDF you need to be reading. Yep. Subdivision yeah. regulations of person. Have you looked at this yet? Forty-one. I, I, yeah, actually, what I did is I created a whole folder, and I have all this stuff in there. But yeah, this is good for everybody to see. Like, it's that easy, right? You just do a quick Google. Yep. Um, pull up which is, it's crazy. We didn't have this pre-planned. I literally found this in thirty seconds, and I immediately would be looking for like any plat exempt language. Like I see exclusions. Um, here's something, a minor final plat that looks interesting. Um, so what I gleaned over this one is if it's under 25 parcels, I think I might be able to be exempt. I don't know though. This is, I, I don't know the language. I haven't really done this that much. Um, division greater than 10 acres, no street right away is involved. What is that? So the one thing with this parcel is it has a, um, it has a easement to access it. So, which we have a 30 okay. foot easement and I think I might have to expand it to be a 50 foot easement with. So, so um, the next step that I always like to do and I probably would have done before doing this is actually like pulling up a polygon on the map to see how it sits. So maybe we can have you present after this, but what yeah, I'm I'll seeing immediate, immediately is like, it looks like they have greater than 10 acres, no street, if no street of right away dedication is involved. So the way I'm reading this is 
um, 10 plus acres and no private road created. And I would, I would read through this. And then what I would do, what you're about to show and share, is I would actually have it on Google Earth broken out how you're thinking to do it and kind of have a little scheme in mind. And then I would be on the phone with person counting like, hey, downloaded your subdivision PDF. It's 41 pages. I scanned through there. And this is what you always want to do. Like I like to build credibility with whether it's a realtor, the county, whatever, because like back to that water district situation I was talking about, you don't want to be the jackass who calls up like, oh, I'm looking to subdivide land in Person County. Um, how how do I do this? Like, how can I not have to do any platting or anything? And they're going to be like, first thing I'll probably say, sir, did you download the subdivision regulation PDF? <laughs> so, you know, I always hit them. I download the PDF. It's 41 pages. I scan through there. I see you have an exclusion section. Um, it looks like 10 plus acres with no r right away included like is is that true like if i were to do this project and keep it 10 plus acres can i basically just not have to do any approvals and they would you would have some back and forth with them and then what i would probably end up doing is getting an email i would screenshot that and send it to them like this is what i'm proposing and see what they have to say <clears throat> okay yeah so what i did is I, I i work with a really good realtor in this area and i talked to him about it and he said in this area you could get three to four acre parcels sell like crazy. We have people paying like between 60 and 80 K a parcel. Um, okay. So I'm like, wow, that's awesome. Okay. So I, I went through, I chopped this up just on map, right? I went in and I was like, okay, what can I chop this up at where I could add minimal roads? I did see like, you have to have a, a roundabout in everything. So if it's one point of entry, you have to have a roundabout, right? So I did that right here. Basically, it, in this yellow, it would come around, wrap around, and then exit back out. So everybody on all sides would have their parcels. Um, this okay. is like 17 in total, and they're all about three to four acres. And then right here is my easement. Coolest, coolest part about this deal is everybody scrubs out landlocked properties. Now, looking at this property, it looks landlocked because yep. this parcel right here gives you the easement. So if you scrub this out and mailed it, you would not have gotten this deal. But because... I didn't scrub it out. Not many people are mailing this guy. So we ended up locking this up for 145. Okay. So um, two grand an acre, basically. Two grand an acre. I could sell it right now for um, 350K as a straight flip. Just listing it right back on the MLS, selling it. Dang. I can make sell for 350. So it's 70 acres, 71 acres total. Um, but I'm like curious. I already have a lender. My lender is good with like holding money on this. Okay. Is this worth something like that you would kind of go down? Is it worth doing it? Or is it something like, ah, just make the 200K and move on? Well, it's definitely worth doing it if you can do it. But there's a lot of steps between here and then for you, I think. Sure. The first thing yeah. is going to be seeing if you can use that easement access to get back there. Mm -hmm. Some counties do not like that at all. Other counties and states will be fine with it. And then alternatively, I would be looking at what 10 acre parcels might go for. And if you could get yourself in a plat exempt situation, which it don't look like you're going to be able to, because based on what I just read with that PDF, it looks like if you do any sort of right away or roadway, they're going to want you to do a plat. Um, okay. And that the way that parcel is shaped does not shape up very well to do any sort of configuration um, without some major road work. So with that being said, alternatively, maybe you do a platting process. The platting process might not be hard in Pearson County. So, you know, call them up. Okay, I can't do the 10. What if I do the three, four, and five acres? Okay, you want me to do a road? Okay, what sort of road? Gravel is going to be – paved roads, I think, would kill this deal because you'd be looking yeah. at uh, how many road uh, – how long of the road – uh, how much road you need, but like at least in Texas, paved roads we're talking like $150 per linear foot versus gravel, which is probably about 20 bucks per linear foot. So, I mean, I can't tell based on that, it's probably a half mile of road. It was uh, yeah. Yeah, everything about about 5,000 square, uh, 5,000 linear. Okay, so you're looking at about a mile, road, a mile of road. Yeah, so you also have it looks like maybe some terrain and tree issues. So, this is going to be basically an underwriting project for you okay i can sell it for this much as is how do i get it to these smaller lots basically two economic scenarios 10 acre or some plat exempt scenario which you'd have to ask the county about but it don't look like it's going to be possible here mm -hmm. that versus the other scenario of going through a platting process okay i need to 
do some sort of survey and potentially some sort of drainage study or engineering. I'm going to need to build out roadways. Do they need to be gravel or paved? And I probably need to run power. How much is that going to cost? And once you have kind of all of those costs into a spreadsheet, I would be weighing that. Is it worth it to get it down to four acre, five acre lots? Or is it better to sell as is with keeping in mind um, how much money you need to put into the deal and the time frame to get it okay. done? Some of these counties take six months, eight months to get approved. Pearson County, if they're like, oh, we get you approved in two months, you need a gravel road and um, a light drainage study to see if there's any topography issues. You know, drainage study, probably five grand, gravel roads and clearing, probably 100,000 bucks there because you got 5,000 foot. Running power, depends, could be anywhere from 50K to two, 300K. Um, mm -hmm. And once you got all those in mind, I'll be running an IRR calculation. And all this is not hard. You're probably looking at three, four, five phone calls, one to the county. Um, probably one to the commissioner, something like that, a couple to the county, see what the roadway requirements are going to be. Probably mm -hmm. one to the power company, a couple road contractors, get bids, probably five, six phone calls, round up a bunch mm -hmm. of costs and, um, you know, yeah, start yeah. underwriting. That's pretty awesome. I, I actually, so in uh, Morton County, I did 600 feet of road, um, well, driveway. It was like 25 feet wide by 600 feet and clearing of three and a half acres total um, on like an uh, almost 12 acre parcel. And that only cost me eight okay. grand to do all that stuff. So it wasn't terrible. Um, and half of that was just a, the gravel road anyway. So that's like, that was what, probably four grand. So probably 50 grand, I'd say, if I'm doing a gravel road in that area, it's about a mile. Let's just throw numbers out there. But I did look at this and I found like their roadway information and all that stuff. And it looks like, just without reading too in too deep into this, it looks like it's acceptable to use like ag for it, which is pretty cool. If I could just do um, crushed stone or ag, then I wouldn't really necessarily need to do a gravel um, paved road, right? Um, yes. Okay, so that's some of the stuff you look for. So what I did is like I started into... creating this like this spreadsheet and I all the applications, the fees, the zoning, the land plan use. I put all that stuff together. Okay. Um, in a drive and then each county I'm doing this for. And this is like the areas that I work already. So I'm just kind of adding into it. But uh, so this is kind of like a good first step. If you're first doing this, you got a good parcel. You think this might be a good deal. You found it on the MLS, whatever the case may be. That's what you would do. You go to Google, you do all your little searching, pull that stuff up, put it all together and then just decipher it. And then. Yep. And I would start making phone calls to the county. And this is the power to focusing on an area like I was talking about. Because you're going to make these calls to Pearson County. And they're going to be like, Dennis, yeah, man, we need this gravel road. We're going to need a drainage study. And you're going to have to widen it right away. Um, we're okay with it being an easement, but you're going to need, need to widen it. And then you're going to run all your numbers. And it's going to cost you 400000 bucks to do all this. You're buying it for um 140 so you're 540 into it and you think you can sell it for whatever and if the project works or doesn't work that's cool but let's say it doesn't work now you're going to find another piece in pearson county north carolina probably a week three weeks six weeks from now and you're like okay let's see what this piece has got going on boom you know all the county you know a cost per linear foot to run a road through there and then it's just like clockwork and now you got a quick simple easy underwriting process and you're like oh Last deal, I was only going to make 500 Gs, but this one's got a little bit better terrain, a little bit better road frontage. Like, I don't have to build as much road. I'm going to crush it on this one. So that's that's why, you know, imagine, like, some people try to mail this out, like, 100 different counties. Like, I want to find a subdivision project. Well, okay, you find 10 leads come in from 10 different counties. Like, it's going to take you forever to get comfortable with the road contractors and the underwriting process and the different power companies and all those different counties. Like, it's just not really a feasible strategy. No. Yeah. Find a target market and work that target market. You can flip land every, everywhere, but I would say like, if you're going to do like really subdivisions, it's just like pick a few good markets, learn them. And then that's that. Right. Um, yeah. Yep. That's awesome. Super insightful, man. Like, and is it something that do you ever partner with people? Like if you have, if they have deals, um, I know you're yeah. very like specific about the areas you work. Um, but is that something that like you ever do? Like do you, somebody brings you an off market deal? Is that, I don't know. I, I get asked that all the time and I don't. Oh, and the do. reason why is because it's a lot of work. It's a lot of time and effort and stuff to do this. And I don't have 
a deal flow problem and I definitely don't have a team or structure in place to handle partnerships and joint ventures. Even if, and from a personal business perspective, I don't know that that's a good strategy to scale because I would need to build team a team or utilize my team to work on joint ventures and partnerships and projects with people. Or alternatively, I could go find all the deals myself, which is what I do, work on funding, work on massive deals, and just focus, hyper-focus all my energy and do those deals and reap 100% of the rewards. So like, if you got a project and need help and need consulting, like I'm all about it. I'll do it. But to partner with people and everything, like it's just not a good business strategy. I am doing my first one right now, like a very small partnership. And mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. nothing against the person I'm partnering with. It's nothing against anybody. I just know that I probably don't want to do it again unless it's a very mm -hmm. unique situation because it's time, energy. We're running marketing. We're handling calls. We're doing, you know, paperwork. And um, I'm coaching this person and everything at the same time. And they're crushing it. Like, I'm going to make money on the partnership and they're going to make money. But it's like, man, I'd rather just have 100% of the deal and if I'm using my team and my resources, I want 100% of the upside. Mm -hmm. wow, yeah, no, awesome. I totally agree. No, I mean, that's that's the, that's the cold hard truth, man. It's not like you're doing this. You're not doing it for free. You're going to do all yep. the same effort to get half the deal. It's hard. It's really hard. Yeah. Especially, I mean, if you don't have a deal flow problem. If but, you're not doing any marketing and they're bringing you deals, it totally makes sense. You don't have that but if you're if you're a person trying to do your first subdivision or first land deal, you should be hitting up all the John Jasniaks or Sumner Healy's or Dennis's like in the world. Like, will you partner? Will you joint venture? Will you mm -hmm. fund? Like, there's people out there who will do it. And if not, then you know there's people like me who will help you. I'm not gonna partner with you, but shoot, I'd rather see you make a hundred percent of the return. Like, let me help you, and we'll figure it out and you make a hundred percent. Like I don't need to hold your hand or partner with you. Like I'll hold your hand as a coach. I don't need to partner with you to, to help you. And I'm sure y'all you, do the same stuff. It's like, you know, you yeah. Let the student get a hundred percent of the upside. <laughs> I want to make you a millionaire. Like I don't need to take equity or partnership in your deal. Yep. Exactly. Like there's, there's people, there's uh, one kid, Aaron, Aaron Waxman. I kind of like hopped on a couple of zooms with him, showed him how to do like, like how to basically do land investing, the basic flip stuff. And uh, I'm like, dude, this kid's going to crush it. And I, he's like, what can you do for me? Like, what can I do for you? What can I, can I pay you? I'm like, no, dude, just be successful and then go pass it on to somebody else. That's what it's all about. Like, I don't need it. I'm good. I'm, I'm getting my own things. I'm happy. Like, go do you. Enjoy yourself. And then you grow your wealth and go help more people. That's just what it's all about. There's it's like, we there's a mentality. Yeah. And there's a weird thing about real estate investors, man, specifically, um, we, we tend to be very cocky and arrogant because especially if you're doing deals, you're like, I'm doing deals. I'm having success. I'm making money. And we tend not to want to reach out for, uh, to others for help. We tend not to want to buy a book or we tend not to want to Google stuff and read stuff and watch YouTube videos and, and learn stuff because we're doing deals. We're making money. We're having success. But yep. there's a lot of people out there who are willing to pick up the phone and help you. And just that's my advice is like, don't be so cocky and area. And I find myself doing it all the time. I, mm -hmm. this, I don't need this person. Why am I, why am I watching Sumner's YouTube video? I have my own stuff going on, but it's like, you know, you got to no. step away from that and humble yeah. yourself. And if you're new to this, don't go reaching out to people and just being like, John, I appreciate everything you do. How can I serve you? How can I help you? Like that? Don't do that. I, I get like, I'm sure you get it way more than that. You, I do, but I get it all the time. It's like, I don't, I don't need you to do stuff for free for me. I want you to go, if you're going to do something, do something and like create problems and then say, how do I fix this problem? Like that's the stuff I want to see because now it looks like you're actually doing the work. You're actually doing the hard stuff. Now you're just like asking for a little help on the backside. I love yep. that. But I hate when people are like, how can I just work for you for free? How can I do this? And I, whatever. It's just, yeah. So don't do that guys. Don't be an, don't be an asshole. What I say all the time. Um, love it. Dude, we got so many questions in here. So I got a few of them that are starred. I could just drop them on here. Um, okay. Yeah, I'm reading through them too. Let's just freaking hit it from the top. And if anyone has more questions, let's just drop them in. I don't know how long you want to go. I'll go as long as I'm we good, want to go. I'm good all day. Whatever you got. All right, so I just dropped one on there. Um, you ever run into a subdivision that's not getting approved? Yeah, for sure. Um, I'd... I've had a massive issue before where I did a subdivision that I thought was plat exempt and it needed to go through a subdivide process. And that was a big no, no, um, mm -hmm. myself and students have had things get denied and not approved. And that's the super importance and critical component of 
trying to get all that done in, in the due diligence period. And if not, buying the land at such a good price that you can sell it as is, such as your deal that you're talking about now. I've actually never had a subdivision get denied after I've closed it and still bought the deal and sold it. So to answer that question, no, but I've seen it happen to others. I have a, uh, a guy right now who's doing one in Colorado and the county doesn't have any subdivision regs. And he went before the board and they said, uh, because Colorado is the 35 acre exemption and they said, nope, we don't want any more acre, uh, any more lots under 35 acres in this county at this time. And that was just the reason for denying it. But luckily he bought the land at such a good price that um, he's going to sell it as is. And it's just two 40 acre pieces. But, mm -hmm. you know, if that was a bigger deal, that's a big no, no. Like, don't do that before you close the deal. Like, do everything you need to do after or, or while you're in due diligence period, basically. Yeah. So do your due diligence before you actually close on a property. I mean, yes, that's simple. <laughs> um Okay, so let's go for the next one. Can you subdivide without having any money? I, can I just I'm gonna answer a little bit of this? I'm already going to just, before John even says anything, I'm going to say no, right? And the reason why I say that is you need to have a little coin in your pocket to be able to do something. But what you can do is start small and work your way up. I feel like subdividing is an ascension strategy. It's not something that you're going to step right into, though there are outliers of people that just jump into this and just start doing it, right? That's the exception, yeah. not the many. Okay, so just, just think about that. Now, what you can do is you could send out some direct mail. You could figure this stuff out on a small scale, one, two lot flips that you send out $1,000 worth of direct mail. You get a lot, have somebody else 50-50 on it with you, and you make four or five grand, and then you parlay that into your next deal, and you grow from there. That's how you get money to get the subdivides. That's my answer. John, what do you have to say about that? I would generally agree because you're going to need money for engineering, some improvements, whatever. Like, is there going to be an outlier um, that has found a funder or some investor who's like straight blank check, like writing the whole thing and you're going to do the subdivide with their pocketbook? Basically, yes. But in that case, you're a beginner probably and have little to no credibility. So to even convince someone to do that in the first place is going to be pretty dang difficult. Um, so I'm going to say generally you're going to need some money. It can be done very small. It's minor subdivides, 10 to 25 K probably is like a good range to be in. Love it. All right. So uh, tips for new land investors, um, subdivide and regular just land flips. Any, any quick like number one tips or number two tips that you would give? Yeah, you got to get your first deal under your belt. So it's all about deal flow. So sending out mail, sending out text messages, cold calling, be on the MLS looking every single day, getting familiar with markets. It is getting more and more competitive out there. More and more real estate investors entering the land arena specifically. A lot of real estate investors out there. So you got to, I mean, it's going to take a lot of focus and reaching out to people, making calls, sending out letters. You got to get that first deal under your belt. Love it. All right. So we got, uh, how does one buy a town? That's crazy. <laughs> Found it on Facebook. Um, it was listed. Um, yeah, there was another one listed out here, actually, Lobo, Texas. I, I went and toured it. I had the chance to buy it. I didn't end up buying it because it was a mess. And I wanted to focus on this. But, I mean, public listings. Or if you really want to buy a town, you could go to the GIS map. And you could click Cornutus, Texas, pull the owner from the CAD roll, and write them a blind offer. So if you want to offer me, at this point, it's gonna. I was telling, talking to Brian about this the other day. He was like, "Would you let it go for 10 million?" I was like, "Nah." He's like, "I was like, maybe 25." So if someone wants to send me like a direct mail piece offering 25 million for Cornutus, I would consider it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. What's their uh, ec economic driver there? <laughs> The cafe for sure. Once this thing gets sure. up and running, and then we'll have the short term rentals, I think, secondarily to that. That's so awesome, dude. Can I build an RV park out there, man? We got one. We got a six spot RV park that we will probably expand to 12 or 15 um, this year, I hope. Nice. Yeah, if you're ever looking to expand it even more, let me know. I have a bunch of people that want to open up RV parks and stuff like that. Okay. You basically, just, hey, I'll lease you the land and do like a long term lease and make money without any of the risk. Yep. Um, all right. So we got Jeff, you had the first question of the day. So 
get the honor of their first questions from here the earliest. How do you subdivide land when you don't hold title? And if someone wants to pay off a particular parcel, but you still owe, let me see, I think there was a second So part. I think he's talking about the wrap strategy and buying it on seller financing. Yeah. Yep. So when you buy it on a financing scenario, you actually do hold the title. The seller is going to have a lien on the property, um, but we set up a creative investor-friendly deed of trust slash mortgage up front that removes the due on sale clause. So as I pay Wildwood Property Partners their 2,600 per month, it allows me to subdivide it and sell it off to customers. And should the customer like in that deal pay me cash, we have worked into that creative deed of trust, a special clause that calls for what's called a partial release. So when I sell 10 out of the 88 acres, I go to the underlying lien holder and do 10 divided by 88 times the remaining principal amount left on the note with the seller and I write them a check. They write me a release for those specific 10 acres and I pass that on to my end buyer. That's the long story mm -hmm. short on that. Yeah, so it's a partial lien release essentially. Like, Yep. Okay, that's awesome. So that, that that's very simple to do too. And structuring all that stuff is just an attorney, right? He just kind of draws all that all for you? Yeah, and now it's turned into a template document basically. And I have I mean, I'm really savvy on contracts and everything myself, but in the very beginning, it was an attorney, hey, can you create me a deed of trust that enables this? And we had some back and forth and came up with a mm -hmm. working document. All right. So then Jeff also, what happens if you're able to sell some of the lots, but the others, and you want to give back to the original owner? Um, I don't really know. So basically he's saying, let's say you can't sell them all. Do you give them back to the original owner or are you just stuck with them? That's kind of like, those are yours, right? Because you're, you're technically on you could default on your note. If I wanted to be a real jerk, I could, you know, let's say I sold six of the seven, and the seventh one for whatever reason had toxic waste on it or whatever, and I could not give it away. I could technically stop paying that seller who sold me the land, and they would foreclose me, and they would be left holding the bag on that one lot of the remaining. But you know, they would have gotten paid out in this case six. 80 90 percent whatever it is and they would take back that last remaining piece and then yes they would be responsible with selling for selling it or just holding it or whatever but they would have sold the majority of their land to me um that's i've never had to do that it's, yeah that would be like yeah. a real extreme situation is there like a inflection point you kind of look for like all right when i sell 40 percent of these lots i should have already paid the seller back do you do that or do you just keep the loan going until every lot sold? Uh, that's funny. I had this question come up in my group this last week and I am okay. a huge proponent of using the seller as the bank and as long as you can. And what I will, so to answer the question, no, I won't prepay back the debt. I won't pay it off early. Um, what I will do though is refinance with that seller. So in this case, if I sold half the property, um, four out of seven lots, let's say, and let's say the remaining three lots were only cash flowing a thousand a month each. So I was getting three thousand a month in, but I was paying out twenty six hundred per month. I'm only cash flowing four hundred bucks, and their note has already been paid down so substantially. What I could go to back to them and say, Hey, look, I've already paid off uh, seventy percent of your note. We need to reduce this twenty six hundred a month payment down to only thirty percent, which would be uh, $780 a month and boom, now my cash flow that I'm making every single month explodes again and I'm paying them over time um, on their full five-year note. So I've done refinances like that, especially mm -hmm. I had a massive project, my Jazz Acres deal where I was paying the seller 15 Gs a month and I ended up releasing like a third of it or so and my cash flow was still insane. I was still at like 30000 a month or something coming in and so I was still making a healthy amount, but I was like, eh. I want to I want to refinance with them because we're talking big numbers. So I got them to reduce from 15 down to 6,500. So my monthly cash flow, you know, increased by another 8,500 bucks. So refinancing is the way to go. I wouldn't pay it off. Mm -hmm. um, you could, but I wouldn't. If you're Dave Ramsey, you would. But if you're Robert yeah. Kiyosaki yeah. or Grant Cardone or John Jasnack, you would not pay it off. <laughs> I'm all about leverage. Oh. Man. I hate paying loans off. <laughs> I'll uh, leverage if it's all good. Better. If it's good debt and it's low yeah. interest rate, why would you pay it off? I know. And if they're secured, everybody's happy. Why would you pay it off? I totally yep. agree. Um, that's awesome. All right. So what's a, I got another one here. What's an example of a loophole for a beginner? 10 plus acres in Texas, five plus acres in Tennessee. Um, Exemption you're talking about, right? 
Now, yeah. So the exemption basically, basically means exemption is basically you could divide a lot down to 10 acre parcels without needing the town's approval, right? Or the county, yes. Okay. Um, a lot of it's going to be controlled. When you step out of city limits, it's 99% of the time going to be controlled by the county. When you're inside city limits, it's going to be controlled by the city. Um, so it would be outside of city limits in the county. And loophole in this case is synonymous with exemption. Um, so utilizing those plat loopholes, plat exemptions, what you basically want to get it down to is only needing a survey. That's only going to cost five, ten thousand bucks, depending on maybe twenty, depending on the size of the project. That's mm -hmm. the only mm -hmm. cost that you're going to have. It's the only time that you're going to need to take. Run the surveyor out there, ready to sell the next day. So Texas, ten plus acres. Tennessee, I believe it's still statewide, five plus acres. Person County, Person County, North Carolina, ten plus acre lots fronting the road. Um, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Okay, so if you're on a so Person County, let's say that was. Basically, if I'm the, if I'm on a private road, then I have to get the town involved, right? But if I had road frontage on this parcel, then I could have just chopped it up in 10 acres and I'm good to go. The way I read that quick yeah. scan, I would have to do a deeper dive, but the way I read sure. it quickly is 10 plus acres along a public roadway, you would be good to go. So if you had a nice long road along that 70 acres and it was, you know, a rectangle along this road and you just cut it up into seven, 10 acre lots all fronting the road, I, from what I read, it looked like you'd be good to go. Cool. So that's basically like, Hire a surveyor. They go out there. They survey the land. I say, hey, plot this out into 10-acre parcels. You'll probably get like a 70-acre. You might get like eight, 10 acres and one oddball. And then you just sell them and you're done. Or yeah. um, sorry, six, six, and then uh, one oddball kind of thing. Right? Yeah, it depends. I mean, it, if you're at 69.5 acres, you'd probably be screwed. You'd have to do, you know, six lots of 11.5 acres each or whatever it is. But if you were sure. 71 or 70.5 acres, like you'd probably be good for seven lots and all 10 plus acres and yeah, you'd be good to go. That's pretty sick, okay. So exemptions are basically the key to like really getting started and then- I would think so, yeah. Okay. Um, That's my tips for the beginners always is stick to a plat exempt deal first per subdivide. That's awesome. All right, so let's see what else we got. We got questions for John. Uh, can you start with that money? What are you seeing? Green flags, red flags, when you're looking for potential. Red flags, green flags. What's a red flag? What's a green flag on a deal? Green flag, a lot of road frontage, favorable county with easy, loose regulations. Road frontage when subdividing is probably the key to it all. The more, the better. You can probably pay more, though. That'd be, you know, if you had your 70 acres along a road, you probably wouldn't be paying 140. You'd be paying a lot more than now your economic calculation becomes a lot different as opposed to if it's a deal or not. So road frontage access, um, favorable county regulations in a favorable state, red flags. When I see that massive PDF document where it's like all these subdivision regulations inside the city and ETJ, that's a whole different ball game business model. You're going to have to do a lot more entitlements, rezoning, potentially engineering, um, red flags, uh, I mean, that's that's really it, because you could make an argument that like power and water, like no power, no water are red flags. But if the price is right, I would still do the subdivide as a rural uh, recreational piece like Hudspeth County out here. I mean, I did a piece where I bought it for seventy five dollars per acre, um, five hundred thirty four acres for 40 grand, bought it for seventy five dollars per acre and mm -hmm. I sold it all off for five hundred dollars per acre. So it's like if I could buy land for a dollar and sell it for five or ten bucks an acre, like I would I would still do it. Love that. Yeah. So it's, it's pretty much like you could do whatever. Like you just got to make sure like you're following the regulations and make sure it looks good. So something that gets you excited, like if you see a parcel that has like double sided, triple sided road frontage, is that like, oh, dude, this is a home run deal. Like, is that something that you would get excited about and like call? For and sure. call immediately? I would get real excited, but then I would probably get not excited when I as excited when I saw the, uh, the price because I think, you know, 90% of the time the sellers know, oh, I got great road frontage. Um, I'm going to sell my land for more. Or the realtors listing their land know that. I mean, are you going to find the diamonds in the rough where it's like it's a stupid, stupid good deal with a crazy amount of road frontage? For sure. You're going to find them. You look hard enough. You do it long enough. You're going to find them. But 90 plus percent of the time that, I mean, you're going to, in real estate, you get what you pay for. A lot of times they say location, location, location. It's like it's going to cost more. Um, so now your economic calculations uh, become become different um 
but yeah, I would get real excited about that. <laughs> yeah. Have you yeah. ever done a major subdivide where you're actually selling paper lots for a builder or? Never to builders. I've done, I've worked with mobile home companies and most of my sales, 99% of them go straight to Joe Schmo who want to move out there from the city or for whatever reason they want to buy it. We're doing a major subdivide right now in Midland County, Texas. It's 150 acres. We got 65 lots. One of the lots has a beautiful 3,200 square foot custom built home on it. So we're selling the home and then we're selling all the lots and we have to do we had to do a drainage study. We have to do drainage ditches. We have to run power. We have to build 20 foot wide caliche roads. Um, that'll cost 150 G's, which is not bad. Um, mm. But yeah, I, we do them, but just not with builders because builders, man, they're, they're so slow, especially the mobile home companies. They want to do crazy contract with crazy option periods and due diligence. Yeah. Everything yeah. really just has to line up. They have to do their market research, et cetera. And I was like, I want to move fast. Like I could put it on mm. Facebook marketplace and have that sucker sold in a week. <laughs> I have a, a parcel we were looking at. It's a 43 acre parcel in um, North Carolina. And okay. the guy actually, he does stuff the wide. So what he did, he already put the roadways in with turnarounds and all that stuff all paved. So I was talking to him. He he chops them up to like one acre parcels, but he goes through the whole gamut. Water, they're turnkey. They're water, they're cleared. The water, sewer, or septic approved, and uh, all that stuff. Electric, everything. And I asked him, I was like, you know, how much, how much did he buy the land for and how much does he plan on exiting for? So, and he okay. took, he bought the land for $10,000 an acre. Okay. So 430 K and he's selling each parcel, each, um, yeah, each plot for, uh, I think he said 60 grand. Cause you could build a $250,000 house on each one. Okay. So between 250 and 300 typically for your low base income. And then obviously more than that. So he's selling the entire, um, platted subdivision. To a builder for that which is pretty cool um so, but it's four years this is his yeah, fourth year he's in it that's what they like that's like, what they flat. don't yeah. yeah that's what they don't tell you and that's what i was we're on the same wavelength here because i was immediately thinking you plat it down you put in sewer you put in water you get it all ready to go for a builder rezone whatever you need to do that is an entirely different business model than what i'm talking about and i think what yep. you're going to find if you just looked at a pure IRR yield internal rate of return metric what is going to get you the highest mm -hmm. return on your money I don't think that his IRR is going to be nearly as high as me nope. doing the business model I have and selling it within three or six months like I'm not going to be able to go 10,000 I don't know how much much on a per acreage basis it's 60k per lot so he might be turning it into 150,000 per acre or 200,000 per acre. If he can yeah. get like three lots per acre, let's say he can get three lots per acre. He's turning 10,000 into 180,000, but that's taken him four years. He's needed to put in money and time engineering, doing all this stuff versus me where I can buy for 10 and probably sell it for 25, 30, maybe 40. So I'm only getting, let's call it three X instead of an 18 X, but I'm getting that in three to six months. Plus I have very little capital expense versus him where he has a lot more capital expense, a lot more risk, and a lot longer time frame. It's a whole different economic calculation. I will say, though, what his model is a lot more scalable because you can do that, and you could you could yeah. rip probably yeah. billions and billions of dollars, but I'm not there yet, and I, I could scale this model to probably a billion, certainly 100 million. So it's like a whole different ballgame. Yeah, I talked to him when I was talking yesterday. I said, well, look, what kind of land are you looking for and how much are you paying? He'll pay between ten and 25000 an acre. So in my head, I'm like, I'm buying it at 2000 an acre. I could just go sell it to him for eight thousand dollars an acre more, and then let him deal with the headache, and that's that. He's like, "Yeah, if it's, if it's in these counties and all this stuff, we'll buy it. Anything five acres and above, we'll buy it." And I'm like, "Dude, perfect, love that." So, what you? I think what you're gonna run into though is his yeah. crazy due diligence and very fine tooth comb in order for your project to hit his metric. I think it's gonna be a lot harder than oh, yeah. than you think. Yeah, but exactly. But if it does, yeah, you're gonna bank. Exactly. That's kind of my plan. I'm like. I want to get into eventually building my own subdivisions. I just not there yet. That's probably like a five to 10 year plan. Um, but right now getting into all that stuff, like learning how to do this is, is essential to that. But you're doing a lot of Carolina stuff. Is that where you're mostly focused? Yeah. Carolinas are 80, our 80, 20 is probably 80% Carolina. And the rest of the stuff is like Florida, Georgia, stuff like that. Um, Carolina is good. Area. All those, all those States are good areas. Uh, it's, it's ridiculous. North and South Carolina. They, there's so much money going there. And I saw it um, about 10 years ago. I went down there 
And I saw one um, York County, uh, South Carolina, which is right outside of Charlotte, North Carolina. Just the amount of building they're doing there is just absolutely insane. They're just going nuts. So I was like, man, I got to figure this out. And that's kind of like kind of opened my brain into a lot of things. Um, So let's see. His his seller finance is one of your main exit strategies. How do you protect yourself against defaults? If seller finance. Yeah, yeah. So as nomenclature, I always call seller financing when I'm buying the land, when I'm selling the land, I call it owner financing. They're synonymous though. I know what he's talking about. I mean, I'd make that distinction from my viewers and my people. So it's just a note that I figured I'd throw out there, but it is still a seller financing or owner financing either way. I mean, it is my main exit strategy. Then I will sell those notes if and when I need capital. Um, so that's how you can exit from holding all that paper. And I sell notes from time to time. Paper stack is a good resource. Facebook private money groups are a good resource. Local real estate meetups. Over time, you need to get yourself three, four, five note buyers who have the capacity to buy your notes if and when you need them. And those people are like gold to you. Protect them, treat yeah. them right, <clears throat> do all the things you need to do. Now, you're not going to, there's no way to protect yourself against the false. That's going to happen. I mean, we foreclose people. Eh, we probably do five to 10 foreclosures a year. It seems like every other month we're out in Texas. It's a courthouse deal. You show up at the courthouse, read off a script mm-hmm. at the courthouse steps. I did three of them last month. We had a big month, Lubbock, Ward, <laughs> and Midland County. Took all the pieces yeah. back, sold, sold them immediately. I took, took them back and we had most of them sold within a week. We had all of them sold within the week for more money than will be paid. So, I mean, Depends on the asset. For desert squares, you're going to be a lot higher default rate. Land in the middle of nowhere, it's probably going to be 25 to 33% default rate. For a subdivision near Midland, Texas, where it's 15, 20,000 per acre, I mean, the default rate is probably going to be 5%. Um, so to protect yourself in that scenario, you want to make sure you're buying a very um, good, high quality piece of land upfront. So if and when someone stops paying you, you know you can go resell it for the same or more than you sold it for the first time. That's awesome. Yeah. Not only that, but you got to get all the money from before. So it's like yes. if you kept a uh, 20% or 10% down payment and then all like their monthly payments, well, you just got to sell a piece of land for twice, like twice. That doesn't happen much in real estate. It's actually pretty we had cool. a We had an acre in Midland County. The dude gave me, I think it was 1500 down. He was paying 500 a month for, he was on like a 60 month note. He paid for like 10 months. So I probably got six or seven G's out of him. He defaulted. He was a horrible payer to begin with. I'm like, dude, I'm sorry. I need to take this back. So we foreclosed him and I sold it basically within three days for 25,000 cash. So <laughs> I love it. Um, how willing are sellers of land? Uh, how willing are sellers of land to negotiate on the sales price? So I guess he's talking about MLS. Like, yeah. Are you always Most negotiating? Sellers, pretty much just oh yeah, like always, man. It's, I think maybe only once I've paid them exactly what they're asking. It was the Jones County piece last year. I bought their land in two separate parts. I bought the first 140, and then I knew I was going to go back and buy the remaining 160. When I came back to buy the 160, I offered them less than what they're asking. Like, nope, full asking price or nothing else. I was like, dang it. So I ended up paying them exactly what they wanted. But especially on the larger deals, it's very, very rare that they're like, nope, I'm 100% firm on this. I'm not going to go anywhere. Um, I say... I've bought land as low as 33% of asking. I think pretty typical is 70 to 80% of what they have it listed for. You know, the Reeves one I just showed was like like 62% plus seller financing. You know, most sellers out there have their their wiggle room, especially on the larger pieces that aren't moving. Mm -hmm. I love it. All right, here's one more question. How do you screen buyers? I don't check credit score. I don't do pay stubs, anything like that. We may go to more of a stringent process here in the future, but um, right now I don't really do any pre-screening other than my conversations with them. If they are complete idiots and they're, you know, just really squirrely and just sketchy, it's like, I probably don't need to be doing business with them. But if they seem like, you know, I talk to them on the phone, talk to them over text, Facebook messenger, they seem like, a pretty normal person like i have no problem if they want to give a down payment and sign documents like i'm all for it let's go you don't go to the car and like look how clean their car is before you go ahead and sell them their land like that's the old like that's I the old like, yeah, yeah 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 that's drive the by their land. house yeah drive by the house the condition they keep their house in now is the condition they're going to keep your house in <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, exactly. Can you explain mineral right? Mineral, mineral. I can never say mineral. Mineral, mineral rights. rights. If you have oil deposits, why not keep and sell the oil? 
Yeah, so it's a really confusing question for most. Um, a lot of people assume that when you buy a piece of land that you get the mineral rights with it. Not the case, especially in Texas. Uh, each state is going to be different, but there's a lot of similarities when it comes to mineral rights. Basically, what you need to know is they're usually separate from the surface. We're talking a whole separate title chain. In Texas, most everybody has reserved their mineral rights somewhere back in the early 19, the mid-1900s. So we'd be talking a whole separate title search and title chain to try and buy them. And so when I buy all my deals, I'm just buying the surface. Now, I do a lot of West and Central Texas where there's oil field. So there's sometimes pump jacks on the land, pump jacks nearby, oil wells. They're extracting the oil under the surface. But myself and probably even the person that I bought it from do not get paid for those mineral rights. And there's a huge misnomer out there that like an oil company can come in and steal your land and, and drill on it and do whatever they want. It's just it's not the case. For those of you in Texas, I would recommend Googling the accommodation doctrine of Texas where it talks about oil and gas and what oil companies need to do in order to come in and extract the minerals. They can't just kick you out. They can't ruin your land. It's, sometimes I get the uninformed buyers who are like, if I don't have mineral rights when I'm buying your land, what's the point? I'm gonna, It's a ripoff. I'm like, dude, surface and minerals completely separate, completely yeah. different yeah. value chains, title chains, the whole nine yards. So that's it's a very complicated subject, but that's the long story short on it. Yeah, and then... Every state has their own different things to that too. Like Oklahoma and Texas are pretty similar with their surface and mineral. But if you go to like Wisconsin, a lot of times you don't get the water rights and like yep. over areas like that. Well, I think it's like Wisconsin, Michigan and stuff like that all around the Colorado. Colorado is a big deal with the water rights. Yeah. So it's, it's pretty crazy. Like, but that's what people need to understand. They're not always inclusive. Of each other. Yeah. Um, so John, what is your first ever deal? 53 acres in the Gunsight Ranch in Hudspeth County, Texas, which is probably 30 minutes south of where I'm sitting right now. Um, I found it online, landwatch.com, 2017. Early 2017, that was my first deal I actually bought. I bought it from U.S. Prime Land out of Florida. The guy was flipping Texas land from Florida. He had it listed for 10 grand. I offered to buy it for 8,500 bucks. Um, we agreed on it. Uh, it was already subdivided, like a lot of the gun site ranches, to five separate 10.6 acre lots, which I all sold off separately, some for cash, some for financing. Walked away with about 17000 bucks on an $8,500 um, investment, and that was the first time I used Facebook for selling my land as well. I listed them to the El Paso buy and sell groups, got a, a few buyers from there. Um but yeah, I still own land in the Gunsight Ranch today because I freaking love it out there. It's an open 32,000 acre open range, open shooting ranch where if you own land in there, you could hunt the entire ranch um, if you'd like. Now it's over hunted and there's not much out there, but people do find good mule deer. So pronghorn out there, coyotes, of course. Um, it's a cool area. A lot of hogs out there. Uh, yeah, there's not, I wouldn't say there's a lot, but there's some um, out there, I believe, out here, we call them javelinas which I think are technically, yeah, javelinas are definitely, uh, I think they're technically a different, some people here might know a different species than a traditional mm -hmm. hog. I think they're, I don't know if species, different species, right? But different variation of the same species. I don't know. I'm yeah, not up about that. It's like deer, deer and mule deer, like white tail. Yeah, exactly, or exactly. Yeah, different, yep. yeah, different whole uh, subset. Um, yeah. Okay, let's see. Have same you ever... Thing. So this is a question I know you know. Have you ever ran the following numbers? If you look at X amount of listings, how many turn to a deal? Yeah, I was telling Sumner there's probably one in, well, I guess there's a difference between how many listings I look at and how many offers I make. Probably one in 20 offers probably turn into a deal because I have it so narrowed down where if I offer on it, I know that I could probably make it work. So I don't have some, it's probably closer to one in 10 actually that I'm making offers on an MLS that I'm actually closing because I just have it so finely tuned in. I know the areas, I know it's pretty much a deal already as listed and I offer a little less and accept. Now, how many deals do I look at? You said probably, probably one in 10 offer and then one in yeah, 20 one in, 10, one in 10 to one in 20 offers, but how many deals do I look at? I would say hundreds. I mean, I'm yeah. on land.com every single day. I do the little mock underwriting exercises, what I talk about. So, like, perfect example would be your Person County, North Carolina deal. Like, I would, okay, the purchase agreement comes in. I put it up on the map real quick, draw out some lots, pull up the subdivision, 
PDF, do a quick little underwriting, figuring, maybe call a county, you know, probably 15 to 30 minute, sometimes even quicker. I'm not even calling the counties. I'm just doing a little quick research and quick underwrite in my head, five to 10 minutes. Like I do probably hundreds of those per, per deal that I actually do. Okay. It's pretty crazy. All right. So let's see. I love this question because I know you don't do this. Um, what <laughs> do you use a loan servicer? Well, the software part is a great question. I can talk on that, but I do not use a loan servicer. I, find that so funny. I won't rule it out in the future, especially as I get massive, but I would rather, as I get massive, I would rather hire it in house because that allows me a lot of flexibility and quickness to default people to send them notices. Whereas loan servicing companies, third parties, they're generally not going to be as quick. Plus you have to charge your buyer a servicing fee, which I do not. Um, so there's added perk on sales velocity and sales on my end, being able to offer that as quote, call it a free service. Um, now the software I use, I use the mortgage office, which is mm -hmm. cost probably eight to 10,000 per year. That's what manages my notes. We do use QuickBooks for accounting, but that's separate. I don't manage my notes and take payments in QuickBooks. That is accounting for business expenses. And then um, we will put their amortization and their payments into QuickBooks. Obviously, when we originate notes, the sales go in there, et cetera. But the actual mm -hmm. loan management where the ammo chart is ticked off, at how much principal, how much interest takes place in the mortgage office, which, you know, you can go all the way from when you start. I recommend just using spreadsheets, just an ammo chart and cross it off as people pay and keep track of it manually. When you get above, call it probably 10 notes, you're going to want to go to some uh, solution, whether it be Geek Pay or Your Land Loans are probably the two that I would recommend for beginners. If you get to, you know, 50, 100 plus notes, um, you're probably going to want an enterprise solution, which the best out there, I think, is the mortgage office. That's what all the big mm -hmm. lenders, big note buyers use. Um, it's very robust. You can have different investors in there. You can be paying 10% uh, here, 10% there, 80% here to different investors on different notes. You can have alerts you can reporting is crazy in there you can send emails send texts it's it's got everything you can imagine that's awesome man. so there's ways to scale this you just don't want to like i i, I love loan servicing because it's like i forget about it i just send it to my servicer he just does all the stuff and he'll let me know if there's problems so that's you know, if your if your goal was to have a lot of free time and sit on your butt and maybe have 10 notes each paying you a thousand bucks a month and kind of set and forget for sure but I guess I'm not the typical, I'm like a freaking psycho. It's like, I, so I'm gonna miss a payment. I, I text them, I send them a notice ASAP and then I make the decision. Do I want to be a complete uh, hard ass and like drop the hammer on them and send foreclosure notice and everything like 21 days or do I want to give them some free time? Like someone texted me today, their um, mom, I think it was passed away. Like, can I have another week to make a payment? Like, I'm not going to send that person a notice, no, uh, you know, but there are instances where people will take advantage of you and they don't reply they you know don't pay whatever it's like those people i want to drop the hammer on because they're taking advantage of me i'm i'm going to take advantage of uh taking their money and reselling it <laughs> that's it all right so uh grab a few more questions hey when you buy on the mls can you make a formal offer to the realtor and sign the document back out frequently do the due diligence or do you do all that first so i guess the question is do you do yeah, your question. due diligence first before making the offer or do you make the offer and then go through your due diligence? Good question. And I believe I have a, a contract sitting in my email right now. And this is the perfect example for this. I do as much due diligence upfront before making an offer because my word, my reputation with that broker, with that um, potential seller, my local reputation and word in the area to other brokers and other people is very important to me. So I don't want to be always backing out of deals. And a lot of this stuff can be done up front without getting under contract, such as on this deal. We called the power company. How much does it cost per foot to run the power? About 8 to $10 per foot. I called the well driller before making an offer. How much would it cost me to drill a well out here? Do you think there's good water, et cetera? Um, I already talked to the county commissioner. Hey, am I good to go at 10 plus out here? Or are you guys going to really make it difficult, even though I know the loopholes and the law and I'm going to fight you on it? But I don't want to have to put up that fight if I don't have to. I want to make a call and be like, Oh, yeah, you're good to go. 10 plus acres. You can do private roads, do whatever you want. That's what he told me. OK, boom, we're good to go. Um, I already did a demand test on this property. I Facebook marketed it as if I owned 10 acre, 40 acre lots out here and saw what messaging I was getting back. So all this stuff was lined up. 
And then what I usually do is I do kind of like a semi-formal offer to the realtor. Hey, I'm thinking about this, you know, whether it's uh, this much down, this term length, 60 day close, 90 day close or whatever, um, just to get kind of the ball rolling. And then we have a little bit of back and forth. Usually I feel like until he actually sends over a formal contract, which is where we're at right now. Um, and what I'll do now is I'll pull this up, do a deep dive on the contract, read it all over um, and see if it's good to sign. And then I will sign it uh, from there. And then, you know, how many deals do I back out of? I, Not many. Um, 10% maybe 10, 20%. Like I don't really, I, I don't really back out of deals. Um, you know, wholesale deals. I don't do much wholesaling cause I hate it. It's painful. Right. Like I backed out of, we went 0 for four last year wholesaling. So those were contracts, but I was trying to flip it for cash deals, but for these subdivide projects or things I know I'm actually going to purchase like less than probably less than 10%. I don't even know if I have backed out of one. Now what would cause you to back out? We'll take, uh, guys, if anybody has like one more question, you good with like one or two more questions, John? Yeah, let's do it. On so, this one, um, it'd have to be extreme, man. Something to do with the general economy. Um, you know, maybe we World War Three starts. I would for sure back out of the deal. I backed out of one when COVID started. I actually lost, that's the one I probably did back out of. I lost $25,000 in earnest money because they wanted 25 Gs, like a lot of earnest money for what we were proposing. And we just ate it. Um, so it'd probably be something general economy, um, something happened to me, something happened to the bi business in general. I guess there, there's a very small chance that um, we follow back up with the county or the water or the power. And they're like, look, man, we thought it'd be $10 a foot. It's really $40 per foot where you're proposing. So it's like, could that happen? Yes. Um, there's a very small chance, though. Yeah. yeah. It'd be more That's general stuff. All right, while you answer this question, I just got to open the door for somebody. But okay. any, any, insider tips, any insider tips in dealing with engineers for site plans? Can you shop them <laughs> for better prices or who to give it with, available, all that stuff? I'll be back in two seconds. Two seconds. Okay, we can get with if it's available. Get it. So when it comes to engineers, contractors, any stuff like that, you're definitely going to want to have multiple bids, talk to multiple different people. It's not always about price. It's more about uh, what have they done before, Project stu uh, case studies, examples. Um, so I would say that. And then one of my favorite tricks to do actually is to talk to the county officials, ask them who's done a lot of surveying, who's kind of the most reputable person in the area, the commissioners, the county clerk. Um, a lot of those folks will know. Um, what you can do as well is go to like the GIS map or it depends what state you're in and start looking at developments in the area. And I'll go in there and I'll pull plat maps, surveys, any sort of um, easements or anything, any site maps that were done by like engineers and surrounding developments. A lot of that are, is recorded public documents such as the survey. Um, you know, when I get a survey done, it has the surveyor's name right there. So I've done, looked at stuff in Navarro or Hill County, Texas, which is south of DFW. And I've never done a project out there and so I didn't have a surveyor engineer so I went to the other one acre developments I knew out there and I started pulling the plat maps and I looked right on the plat it said the engineering company then I called them up so that's a good one um, you're definitely going to want local for sure um, people who can get out to the land people who know the county officials I would say this do not trust with blind faith a surveyor an engineer a civil firm whatever you do not want you want to trust but verify you want to know the regulations you want to talk to the county um, etc. Because I've gotten myself in huge trouble before where they told me I could do something and I was too cocky or too lazy to check with the county and actually make some phone calls. Lo and behold, I couldn't actually do that. And then the county was like, nope, sorry, you actually need to go and plat this and it turned into this whole ordeal. Um, shout out Howard County, Texas, although we are plat exempt out there now. So we're all good. <laughs> you went back for another one. I love it. Yes. Uh, all right. Lots of questions. Um, did you get started in real estate or was the land your first introduction? Dang. I love this question. Um, land was my first intro to real estate. However, I did not start in real estate. When I first graduated school um, and during the end of my time at Texas Tech at college, I just knew I was like, man, I want to do something. Um, I was very much into stock trading. So I had the whole mm -hmm. dual monitor set up, Tim yep. Sykes, penny stock trading, challenge student, going to conferences studying charts, analytics, blah, blah, blah. 
I, I tried developing a couple of products that were more oil field related. Like I wanted to take a, a tumbler such as this, but make it into like a drill bit or make it into like a fire hydrant <laughs> for like uh, firefighters and like make different little pens and like novelty items. I tried blogging. I tried t-shirt designing. Um, a lot of different things. Um, I was definitely addicted to stock trading and I, that's yeah, why I haven't yeah. touched stock trading since because I know if I start doing it again, it's like video games for me. Like I want to just make a million dollars trading a penny stock. But uh, then I found out about land. And then once I started focusing all time and energy on this, I pretty much fell in love with it. And so um, first and only uh, start in real estate. Now, of course, I have Cornutus, which I guess has got me into the restaurant business, RV park and motel business all at once. Um, but that's it, I guess. Yeah, it's a totally, yeah. totally different business that you're in now. It's like you're on the real estate side of things. It's like you're dealing with a whole different spectrum of things. You know, like tenants and kicking people out is just totally different. Um, in Texas, it's very easy, which I love. Um, <laughs> Step out to yeah. California, and you might not be as lucky. Dude, I'm in Jersey, so yeah, I don't, I don't that keep too. anything. I don't keep yeah. anything that's in Jersey. We flip here. Uh, that's it. I don't even buy a house that I'm going to flip. If the seller's not out of the house, I will not close on it. I don't care. I will not take over any holdovers. Nothing. I'm done, dude. Jersey is a wild, wild west out here. You think Texas is, bro? It's, it's a different game. It's freaking wild. Um, yeah, we still flip houses, but I've been doing my, like, my, I do return on effort, my ROE. And my ROE on flipping land versus flipping houses is, like, insane. I could go make 100 grand flipping a house, but I'll probably spend about 100 to 200 hours basically, like, Managing contractors, going through, yep. ordering material, doing all that stuff, right? That's with me doing zero work, right? And I'll make a hundred grand. Well, I could go flip a piece of land that I'll maybe spend two to three hours on, make a hundred grand. So why would I do yep. this if I could do that? Um, so I've been focusing on my ROE, and that's one of my big drivers of why I've been pushing myself out of real estate and more into land. Um, I just think this is just an awesome market to be in. So um cool well, any other anything else we'll wrap it for today and uh you always have you back on it seems like we had 135 people here today so does that um, take into account my folks on my youtube i wonder if it does i think it does sure. i think it's a calculation of everybody okay so yeah cool. which is pretty good it's all, all on my cool. channel i'm showing 72 watching um yeah we had 135 total so nice um <laughs> 137 was where he peaked, which is awesome. That's that's good numbers. So we're I mean, in uh, four places right now. We're streaming. So, Oh, yeah. Well, I don't really have anything else, man. I appreciate you having me on. We should definitely do this again for everyone who's interested in land investing. You just got to start researching. I mean, there's so many free resources and material. YouTube University, that's where I would start. Watch yep. all the videos on YouTube. Listen to podcasts. When you're ready to take it to the next level, it's probably time to start. Buy, buy a small course, learn some stuff. And then if you mm -hmm. want to hypercharge it, get into a private group and get some mentorship. But you can, everything can be figured out on your own. It just depends how much time, sweat, energy, blood, tears you want to put into it. So I love it. So if anybody is interested in learning the land flipping side of things, check out landinvestor.co slash apply. Um, just so anybody knows, anybody, you don't actually have to buy the course or anything like that. But if you just go and you put your name on the list, Schedule a call with Justin. We're going to give away data. Um, we're going to give away a hand-picked county and 5,000 records so that you could go price it and have success on your first mailer. So at least 5,000 records, maybe 12,000, maybe whatever. It depends on what the county has. Um, so anybody go to there, go to landinvestor.co slash apply. Um, drop your name on the thing. Talk to Justin and we'll set you up. I'll send you some data probably this weekend. We'll find out. So. Guys, I appreciate it, John. Dude, thank you for coming. Uh, just stay on for a minute. I just got a question for you. And um, okay. uh, yeah, we'll definitely do this again. Um, this was awesome. I appreciate everybody coming out and hanging out. Uh, it was a really fun day. Hopefully, hopefully it was informative. Um, yeah. Thanks, cool, guys. Yeah, have a good one, all. See you.